The Lord be with you. Good morning. We're glad that you're here. And there are several announcements to make. Um, Matthew's Market is out in the narthex where you uh, come up with alternative kinds of Christmas gifts. There's also unique world gifts. Some of them are on display in the narthex, but the rest of them are in the fellowship hall until maybe 2 o'clock today or something. So if you want some unique gifts, run to the fellowship hall. Bob Nell has several announcements. Where'd he go? There he is. Thank you, David. I just wanted to take a few minutes and make you aware and to highlight some of the concerns and uh, uh, issues that uh, we are uh, considering with the missions committee. We've been quite active in this Advent season with your help, of course. Uh, first of all, thanks to everyone who helped put together the Seniors Morning Out and Homebound ho Holiday Gift Bags. Uh, with your help, we were able to pack 30 bags with uh, uh, war uh, warm items. We had, uh, what do you call those, mitt throws, flannel throws, uh, goodies, uh, oranges, uh, other items that uh, the folks that are not getting around too much can use. Also, Alan Bandy and his, Dr. Bandy and his wife brought 10 bags to our church and we'll be distributing those through the Meals on Wheel program. So thank you for that. Uh, number two, our Sunday community supper continues to be functioning at a high level. We are feeding between anywhere between 50 and sometimes 80 uh, guests on each Sunday night on the 19th of this month, we're having our special Christmas Sunday community supper. Uh, along with the youth, we're gonna be serving a special holiday menu with uh, ham and green beans, all the fixings. And also with this special meal, we'd like to uh, serve some special desserts. So if any of you folks out there would, uh, would like to donate uh, one of your most delicious desserts, to that uh, effort, we would certainly appreciate it. It'll be on the 19th of December. You could bring them to church, leave them in the fellowship hall, or just let us know, uh, Mimi or myself, uh, and we'll be glad to, to disperse those to our guests. In addition to the good meal, we're gonna be handing out a, a gift card to each of our guests. So it's, it's a little bit special uh, above all the other 52 meals that we serve in the year. Also, on the 26th, uh, the day after Christmas, Tommy Styers is going to be providing the meal. He, he's the guy that, that cooks our barbecue for our uh, fall picnics. And Tommy has, has donated the, the food, but we need some servers. And we'd like to invite members of the congregation to join us that night. It takes four or five people. We generally meet around 4.30 or so, and we're generally done by 6.30 or so. Uh, so if anybody, any of you would be willing to help with that, uh, just again, let the church office or myself or me and Michael know. Uh, coats for the homeless. We had a great response from you guys, folks bringing in, in uh, warm winter coats that are being distributed through the Sunday Community Supper, but also through some of the other ministries in the, in the area. There's uh, Highways and Hedges is a ministry that's operated by Phil Williams. And Phil has, uh, has expressed an interest in helping us with the distribution of those coats. On every Sunday community supper, there's a couple named Johnny and Mae Barber who uh, come to the supper with their pickup truck and their trailer and they hand out food bags and uh, other supplies in addition to coming to our uh, parking lot, they also go directly into the homeless camps. And Johnny told me last week that there are two camps, one that has 50 people in it and another with 100 people in it that are uh, sleeping in the woods. And so, uh, so if we can pray for them and, uh, and offer them any assistance that we can. Uh, also, 
credit where credit's due. My wife, Patty, said, you know, the coats, the warm coats are great in cold weather, but uh, they don't keep the bottom half warm. So if anybody has any sleeping bags that may be laying around your garage or not being used anymore, I know we don't get out and sleep in the woods as much as we used to, but we could use those. Uh, any sleeping bags would be great to have to distribute to our homeless folks in the community. Um, at our Peace and Global Witness, our last special offering, we received $943. Thank you all who have uh, donated to our special offerings throughout the year. Uh, three quarters of that goes to a big church, but uh, $236 remained in our community and was donated to outright youth. And finally, of all the bad news that's on the news these days, uh, Afghanistan, it looks like the folks in Afghanistan, in addition to all their political turmoil, are facing uh, extreme food crisis and uh, cold weather crisis as winter comes. So the missions committee will be considering ways that we can possibly respond to this at our meeting next Monday night. But for the time being, please keep them in their prayers. If you'd like to do something directly, I'm sure the PCUSA website has uh, an opportunity to uh, make personal donations, et cetera. But do keep Afghanistan in their prayers. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Let us prepare ourselves for worship. Please stand in body or spirit and join together in the Advent reading. Today we light the candle of peace. The nations shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid. And let us pray together. 
O oh God, you are a refining fire and a purifying agent. We praise you that in Christ you make us whole again. We gather to hear his coming announced and anxiously wait the dawn of your redeeming grace. Fill our mouths with laughter at the prospect of our liberation and our tongues with shouts of joy at the news of our redemption. You continue to do great things for us, O God. Therefore, we come into your presence with the singing. Amen. our sins. God of abounding grace, have mercy upon us. Our valleys are deep when we are encompassed with cares. Our mountains are high when our burdens are heavy. We grope in the maze of our tangled alliances and reap the pain of bad choices and ignorant gambles. You promise that all flesh shall see your salvation. Show us the straight path and the smooth way that lead to your righteousness through Jesus Christ, who is the way. And indeed, Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. And in him we find 
forgiveness of sins. Thanks be to God. Prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way of the Lord, and all people will see the salvation of our God. Prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way of the Lord, and all people will see the salvation of our God. Prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way of the Lord, and all people will see the salvation of our God.
So today we're going to talk about names. Have you ever looked up what your name means? I was interested, so I looked up my name on the almighty Google, and Laura stands for crowned with laurel. And apparently, laurel is what they used to place on a um, Greek champion's head when they won one of their many games. And it's considered lucky. So I consider myself a pretty lucky person. So then I decided to look up Lily's name. Now, Lily, of course, is a flower. And when you think of a lily, you think of peace and purity and compassion and beauty. And I'll say she fits those pretty well. Now, what, is, what does all this name nonsense have to do with what we're talking about today? But today, our Bible story, we get one of the most important, if not the important, most important name in the entire world. And that's Jesus. So when Mary and Joseph found out that Mary was going to have a baby, did they hop on Google and try to start searching for baby names? Or, and, and when I was little, they printed books that had lists of names and what they meant and everything. No, actually, they got Jesus' name straight from God, and an angel told Joseph in a dream. And he said, Mary is carrying God's son, and you are going to name him Jesus. So when we look at what Jesus' name meant, means, he couldn't have had a more perfect name. You know why? Because Jesus means the Lord saves. And that it couldn't be a more perfect name for Jesus, right? Because that's what he came to earth to do. He came to earth to save. So this week, I want you to look up your name and see, does, does your name fit you, your personality and things like that? See what it means. I'm interested, and come back and tell me what it means, okay? All right, so, and as you look up those names, remember the most important name of all, and that's Jesus and what it means. And when you think about Jesus, you think about salvation, all right? So if you are going to blast today, you'll meet Miss Suzanne in the back, all right? And let's pray together. Repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for Jesus and his name, which means salvation. Amen. The reading is from Isaiah 11. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall lie with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And then from Matthew chapter 1. The birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, 
but before they had lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. So who is Jesus? Last week we said he was a promise for the prophets. Today, well, for Joseph, he's a problem. We've got to look carefully to be sure we see the real problem. I mean, the pregnancy itself is troubling, but that's not the real problem. It's a problem. The reading says Joseph was trying to decide what to do about it. He wanted to put her away quietly, for he was a just man, it says. So according to the law, he could break off the marriage plans if she were pregnant. He could send her home in disgrace. And she might well be kicked out of her father's house as well and disowned, and so she'd end up homeless, alone, and vulnerable. Or he could publicly accuse her, and she might even be stoned to death at the city gates. And either way, it wouldn't be easy for Joseph to keep things quiet. People would know why Joseph cancels the marriage. So what to do? That's his initial problem. The real problem is the message the angel brings. The angel identifies the child as the Messiah. Now, should Joseph believe that? And what will people say? What, will they believe him? You see Joseph going up to the gathering place in the village and saying, you won't believe what I just heard. My wife's going to have a baby, and she's, he, he's going to be the Messiah. Nobody's going to buy that. And Joseph has to decide if anybody's going to believe this, and he has to decide, first of all, if he believes it. Now, he's told to name the child Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And this is a pun in ancient Aramaic. I, I know you all got that right away. The name Jesus is Yeshua. It's the same as Joshua. And it comes from the verb that means to save. So his name will be Savior, for he will save his people from their sins. And there's no way to do that in English. It's like the angel said to Joseph, you'll name him Sonny because he'll be the son of God. It's a little like that. But that sounds too flippant, you know. Well, what did Joseph think about all of this? What did the people of that day expect of the Messiah? I mean, some expected a heavenly savior to come in down out of the sky. And others expected a revolutionary to arise and lead a rebellion against the superpowers. But to say that Jesus would save them from their sins, well, there's a new twist. And to say that of a little baby, that's just foolish. We don't know much about Joseph. Aside from this story in Matthew, there's only the question asked later about the adult Jesus where they say, isn't this Joseph the carpenter's boy? 
And that's not really helpful because carpenter is a bad translation. In the original, the word is technon, technos. It means something like builder or artisan. It's where we get our word technology. And in the Middle East, where there's hardly any lumber, you made mud bricks and you piled up stones. In Northern Europe, where there's not that much mud, really, but there's trees everywhere, carpenter was a pretty good translation of the concept. And so Joseph became a carpenter. And the Sunday school picture that you all remember of Jesus with the plane smoothing the wood and his daddy's over in the other side making shaker style chairs is just wrong. Sorry. They were builders, they most likely used brick and stone to build buildings and houses, which meant he wasn't especially poor as those things went in those days, but he wasn't really wealthy either. And we don't know when he died. The usual story is that he was older than Mary because he doesn't seem to be around later on when Jesus is an adult. And some traditions say, well, he died shortly before Jesus went out in his public ministry. But he raised Jesus with his other children which, of course, were probably from an earlier marriage. So what we do know is that he was a just man. And the ancient church tradition honors him as someone who protected Mary and the baby Jesus from dangers, from the dishonor of illegitimacy, from Herod, from the other threats to his life. He cared for them. You know, God chose Mary as the right one to bear the child, and Joseph is the right one to care for the child. The angel could direct him, and he would obey the call of God. And he would trust that this problematic message was true, and so he didn't drag Mary to the city gates to be executed. He had mercy, even when it seemed he'd been betrayed. So he heard what God's angel said, and against all odds, he believed it. He faced the problem of who Jesus is, and he had faith. And Jesus is a problem then, and he's a problem for us as well. What are we going to do with the claim that he's the Messiah, that he's really God? That's the problem we have to face. And the claim is that Jesus is God, the very God who created the heavens and the earth. And that's all staggering nonsense unless it happens to be true. If it is true, then everything is changed. And we have no choice but to believe. And the resurrection is the crux of the matter. The resurrection is a sign and the proof that Jesus is God incarnate, that in him our sins are forgiven and we find reconciliation between us and God. So in resurrection, the claim and the promise that Jesus is the Messiah and the Savior is made real. And so that we face the problem, do we believe it? And when we say, yes, I believe, the problem's not over. Remember those bracelets that said, WWJD, what would Jesus do? They raised that problem. You see, at each moment in our life, we're faced with the question and the problem of obedience and faithfulness. What will you do? Now, when I was in seminary, I had a professor with a, with a volatile temper. You didn't dare ask a stupid question in class. And one day, just as a lecture had begun, there was a tremendous noise out in the hallway. Classroom was on the second floor of the library, and there was a stairway right outside it that went down and outside. And all these people were going down the stairs, and they were making a great deal of noise. 
being famous for his temper, he went out there and let them have it. And they, I'm sure, ran away terrified. We all just prayed quietly that he would not come back in the room and take it out on us. He came back in the room and he grabbed his chalk and instead of talking, he just stood there grinding the chalk into the chalkboard and finally put it down. And he said, sometimes you wish it weren't true. And he went back outside and went down the stairs and we presume found those people and asked them for forgiveness. What will we do at each moment if we're following Jesus? Will we let our angry words and unkind actions stand? Or will we seek forgiveness and reconciliation? So the life of faith is a life of constant struggles and problems and questions. We face our own sinfulness as it creeps in at every moment. And just as my professor found, we we have to face our sin. We say something unkind, or we hear of a need and we don't care. We go all day dealing with our our longings and our business and our thoughts and needs and stuff without a thought of God or Jesus Christ. And we're tormented by our own desires and appetites and enslaved by fears and jealousy and old hurts. And we react to people based on all those things. And these things happen to us all the time. And so every day we need to remind ourselves, be it through prayers or scripture reading or music or whatever, remind ourselves that we've committed to follow this Jesus. And we submit ourselves to him so that the spirit can school us and make us more like him each day. So following Jesus is a problem, but it's worth the effort. Now, Joseph is thrown into this situation. He didn't choose it. He can't have been thrilled. If you look at the orthodox icons of the nativity, Joseph is often down in the corner being talked to by someone, and he has his head in his hands, and he looks glum. He looks despairing. What will become of me? What will people think, he seems to be saying. The temptation to worry about what others think, the temptation to let social pressures override the call of God is great. It's a great pressure. Joseph is called by God to this task. But if he does it, he risks dishonor. People might laugh at him. If he doesn't accept God's call, then he has to do something about Mary, and all the options are bad. And when we're worried about our social standing and what other people might think, we're distracted from who God is calling us to be. Flannery O'Connor said one time, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you odd. And indeed it will. The truth, Jesus Christ, will impact our lives and make us different. People might talk. They might point at us and say, how strange. Faith might even make us suffer. It could be hard. It might be easier just to forget the whole business. I remember a woman who was frustrated. that She couldn't get the women in the Bible study of her circle to talk. They would sit there like owls and not say a word. Some of you have been there, you know. One day it was especially quiet and she said she just shut the book and she says, oh, well, who cares? None of it's true anyway. That got them talking. You can't just forget about it. Jesus has touched our lives and once he's done that, you can't get away from him. There's no place you can go to escape. And the angel tells Joseph he will save his people from their sins. And so if you want to be saved from sin, it takes some work. 
If we want to be saved from sin, we have to see that this means changing. And once we're changed, we'll be different. We'll be like Jesus and not like the world. And in Jesus Christ, God intends to change the whole world, to transform it and redeem it. And that means it'll be different. And so if we're comfortable with the way things are, we don't want to see the world change. If we don't want justice for the poor and for the people down the street, we don't want to get involved with our neighbors. We don't want to love others. If we don't want to be a part of God's program, then Jesus will be a problem for us, just as he was for Joseph. Now, I suspect Joseph still had some questions. And I suspect at night, and late at night, he had some doubts about all of this. But he obeyed the message he'd heard in the dream. He obeyed the command of the Lord God. He did what God told him. He accepted the challenge of this problem. And he lived before God in faith as a righteous man. May it be so with us. Thanks be to God. Amen. say what we believe with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended, he ascended into heaven, heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated.
we come to the table, this is not the Presbyterian's table, this is the Lord's table. And so everyone is invited and encouraged to participate in this sacrament. You have your little handy dandy sacrament kits, I hope. If not, just raise your hand and one will be given to you. So let us pray. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right. It is our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord, creator and ruler of the universe. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. You set us in this world to love, to live in peace with all that you've made. And when we turn from you, turn from us. When we were captives in slavery, you delivered us to freedom. You made covenant to be our sovereign God. When we were stubborn and you spoke to us through the prophets who looked for that day when justice would triumph and peace would reign over the whole earth. And so we praise you and we join our voice all the faithful of every time and place in the Universal Church and the Heavenly Choir. Majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. You sent him into this world to satisfy the longings of your people for a Savior, to bring freedom to the captives of sin, to establish justice for the oppressed. He came among us as one of us. He took the lot of the poor. He shared human suffering. And we rejoice that in his death and rising again, you set before us the sure promise of new life, the certain hope of a heavenly home where we will sit at table with Christ our host. And so remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from this bread and this wine and joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the Spirit, make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us forth to be the body of Christ in the world. Strengthen us, O God, in the power of your Spirit, to bring good news to the poor, to lift blind eyes to sight, to loose the chains that bind, and to claim your blessing for all people. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory and we shall feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm. Hear us, O God, as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, 
as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So on the night before Jesus died, he took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he blessed it, and then he broke it, and he said, take and eat, for this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. All of you drink of it. And as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. And so let us partake. And let us pray together. Now, Lord, you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of every people, to the nations and the glory of your people, Israel.
So go in peace. Go and take the love of Jesus with you wherever you go. And as you go, may all the blessings of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go with you this day and every day forever. Alleluia. Amen. Amen.